Goliaths come in every shape and in size. There's fear, there's insecurities, there's lust, there's anxieties. You fill in your blank. And just when you think maybe you faced the last Goliath in your life, there's another one probably soon to come. Have you ever felt like, man, I just wish I could have a season of life that's like downstream coasting, lazy river style, sipping on my pina colada with Jesus type of season. Like I can just coast into eternity and not have to face these struggles, these battles, these fears that we so easily deal with. And maybe what you want to say is just that. But did you know that God over and over and over and over again, throughout this 66 book library that we have known as his word, the Bible, did you know that, that God does not simply desire to, to get you into a destination? but he desires rather to prepare you for a destination in his perfect plan. Or I've heard one person say it like this, God does not simply wanna get you into heaven, but he wants to get heaven into you. That is his purpose, is to see you changed, to see you transformed, to see you grow into his likeness as a child of God. Today, if you couldn't tell, we're going to be looking at a very familiar story. Uh, this story is uh, in the setting of about 1000 BC. So it's some 3000 years ago. It, it's the story that even if you don't have a church background or a, or a VBS background as a kid, or, or you're just coming in here fresh, like You've heard of these two names, okay? David and Goliath is the story we'll be looking at today. And I wanna catch you up a little bit in this story. Israel had been rescued from slavery by God. God makes a covenant with his children, the Israelites on Mount Sinai. Then God leads them over time into the promised land that he had promised to them. And during the time of the Judges, which is two books before where we'll be reading from, which is 1 Samuel, during the time of the, the Judges, the, the last verse in the book of Judges probably has the best common commentary at all for all of the book. It, it is, the people did as they saw fit. That, that was the land at this time. That was the cultural landscape of this time for the Israelites. They were doing as they see fit. And as you know, we have a bit of a culture today that kind of just does as they see fit. And often we can fall right into that as well. We know that that is moral and utter chaos when this happens. But God raised up a prophet named Samuel. His mother was Hannah. And at this time, the Philistines were rising in power. They were Israelites' villain. At one point, the Philistines whooped the Israelites in a battle, and they took the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a prized golden chest that held the Ten Commandments, and it was very special and symbolic to the Israelites and their relationship and standing with God. The, the Philistines took that and then God took over and God sent some plagues on the Philistines and messed them up real bad and they said take this curse back take this ark back and they gave it back to the rightful owners the Israelites the Israelites then sometime later go to the prophet Samuel and they say we, we want a king like the rest of the nations it seems to be working out really well for them we want one too Samuel then goes before God, God says, you're going to regret that, I'm supposed to be your king, but okay, I'll give you what you want. And then Samuel searches for a king, 
and he finds, a someone, he finds someone who is an obvious choice. He's tall, he's good looking, he's warrior-like. Probably looked a lot like maybe Matt Meckes or something out there. He, he's, the, he's the perfect candidate for king. However, Saul ends up being, unlike my brother Matt Meckes, uh, a prideful, lying, arrogant man who lacks integrity. And it ends up leading to his eventual demise. And Samuel goes to Saul and he says, I am going to find a king to replace you. And the one God ends up raising up to just be very brief. You can see this story play out in 1 Samuel 16. But the one that God ends up ordaining and choosing is the least likely of the bunch. He's the runt of the litter. He's the youngest son of eight from the line of Jesse. It's this young man named Samuel. He's a, or named David rather. He's a keeper of the sheep, which is like equivalent to like having the toilet cleaning job. Okay, some of you boys or, or girls in your family, like you, that's on your chore list perhaps maybe even today, like that is not a fun job, right? And the one God ends up raising up is this one. Yet David is faithful and humble. He's faithful to God and he comes with humility, though he may lack some physical attributes that other kings would have, he is at the head of the class when it comes to the greatest two attributes that you can have as a leader, which is humility and faithfulness. Which brings us now to one of the most prolific, famous stories in all of the Bible. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you're in your Bible, it's very early on in the Bible. It's before Judges. It's before Ruth. There's 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1, 2 Kings, and so on. And so if you have a Bible, I encourage you to flip there. It's one of those stories that everyone assumes they, they kind of know and they kind of understand the point of it. But often what we'll find out is Maybe we don't know, know the main point of this. And so we're gonna just dig in very quickly this morning here, starting in verse one in, in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes in Demene between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. Here's a picture of the valley of Elah here. It, it, just to show you, this is happening in a real place. You can go there during a real time in history some 3,000 years ago with real people who really live. This, this isn't fable, this isn't fairy tale. I know sometimes when we read this story, maybe we, we've been uh, wrong as parents reading to our kids. Like it's almost like we read like, once upon a time, there was a little boy named David and there was a giant who was as big as Pastor John named Goliath. And, and we just kind of read it as if it is fable. But this is a true time in history in a real place where you can visit. Continuing in verse four, a champion. The Hebrew here means the decisive one. The decisive one. It's the only time in the Bible in 1 Samuel 17 here where that particular Hebrew word is used. Champion named Goliath is from Gath came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. Commentators are all over on this. Uh, some say that right there is completely literal. It's nine feet, nine inches tall. Others say there are other extra biblical texts, some that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that suggest maybe he was closer to six feet, nine inches tall and everywhere in between. Pe people kind of go all over. Here's all you need to know. The brother was big, okay? He's a big brother. 
okay? Don't thank me, don't thank Gangly, because I'm telling you right now, some of this stuff that he puts on, uh, I'm, not, I'm not battling in, okay? He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear, his spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bear went ahead of him. If you add up all of that weight, it, it adds up to over 160 pounds on this brother, okay? This was a big dude who was not like your tall, lanky, uh, what's that bowl guy's name from the NBA? He was just super tall and really let. No, this is probably a big, burly dude who can get around as well. Verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then our Philistine said, then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And if you want to jump ahead some verses, verses 23 and 24 in that same chapter, as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion, there's that word again from Goth, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. They were buying the hype. They were like, the math does not add up here. I'm not going, you're not going, we're not going. They're fearful, the Israelites. At one point, I shared this probably a few times, but I was a, an assistant football coach with some 12 and 13 year olds. And what happens when you're a football coach is your team will get ready for battle, ready for a football game, uh, at the goal line while the other game is finishing up. And so it might be fourth quarter with five minutes left and your team's just kind of on the goal line, the back end of the goal line on a knee and you're able to see the other team, the opponents that you're gonna be facing. And on this particular week, we were facing some big brothers from the southern suburbs of Chicago and they were big. And, and we were good as well. We were undefeated at the time, but I saw our team looking over at their team and, and it was fear in our eyes, in our team's eyes. And so what would happen is the game before you would finish and then usually the boys would get up and they'd start riling each other up and they'd, they'd have a little bit of a chant, a little bit of, and none of that was happening. And I'm concerned. And so I step in there and I'm trying to, hype them up a little bit, maybe get the fire rekindled and, and, and they finally start going and they seem to have some confidence. They run to the sideline. What happens is you're about 110 yards away from them when you're goal line to goal line on the back end of it anyway. And all of a sudden then when you're sideline to sideline, you're about 55 yards away. And I look at one of our kids and he's one of our leaders and he looks and he's nodding his head and he goes, coach, these guys got beards and stuff. <laughs> They're 12 and 13, I can see it from here. I don't have hair under my arms yet. Like this is not fair. This isn't a fair fight. Y'all just let us out here to die. And they played and we got whooped. And, 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 and it was the size that kind of threw some of our boys off. But in this particular story, all while this is happening, Jesse sending his young boy, the youngest of his eight, he's sending him to go on a cheese and a cracker run so he can, he can give it to his sons his, or his brothers, David's brothers, Jesse's sons. And so David, this is, just the, this is the story here. David is the, is the Uber Eats guy, right? 
like giving his, his older brothers cheese and crackers. And they're fearful. And this is, by the way, how we know that David was not yet 20 years old because in order to be enlisted in the army at this time, you had to be 20 years old. Most historians believe David was somewhere between 17 and 18 years old. He's a teenager. They're treating David like the teen mom who is in charge of the cooler of Capri Suns, orange slices, and fruit roll-ups at your local Little League games here in Coopersville. This is who David was treated like, but God can use a runt of the litter to show his strength, and that's what we're gonna find out. Let's jump forward um, in 1 Samuel 17 to verse 32. Let's go to verse 32. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man and he's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, this is awesome like pregame speech right here. I wish I would have thought of this some 12 years ago. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, still don't think he's convinced, go and the Lord be with you. It's from there where Saul seeks to put David in some battle gear that would uh, custom this type of battle. But for David, he's thinking to himself, I'm just reading into the text here a little bit. I didn't need this stuff when I was killing bears and lions. I'm not gonna need it for this uncircumcised Philistine that I'm about to go. So it was too cumbersome for him. And so essentially he says, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wear that. And instead he, he grabs five smooth stones that were probably, don't think little pebbles that are in your landscaping beds, that these were stones that were probably the size of tennis balls. And the story continues, starting at verse 42. He looked David over, this is Goliath, and saw that he was little more than a boy. Maybe if you have a different version, it might say ruddy. He's a ruddy young man, a little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. And Goliath despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Must not have seen the stones. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Verse 45, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you down into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. That's why you love the Old Testament, isn't it? This very day, I will give you, give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the bear, or to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The, so the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. That's Hebrew there for worship. Face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine 
with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran, stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword because he did not have his own and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. So the word of the Lord, David and Goliath. Now as interpreters of scripture, because whether you like it or not, we are all interpreters of scripture. As interpreters of scripture, we should be asking ourselves, what does God wanna teach me in this story? What is God speaking in this story? What is the main point? Some pastor might say, what is the big idea in this story? About 10 years ago, I was a Youth for Christ director and also led a youth group at the church I served at. And so there's two different groups and sometimes we would do real big events where we would combine the two groups. So you had Youth for Christ students with youth group students. We'd have over 150, 200 students playing outside. It was basketball, it was sand volleyball, it was flag football, everything in between. It was a beautiful day on this particular day. And what we often like to do is bring in outside voices to come and speak into these kids' lives. And so we invited a local pastor. He was a friend of a friend of mine. And he came and he shared on David and Goliath. And just know, in my younger 20s, I was way less gracious than I am today when it came to theological stuff, okay? But the central focus in this man's message from this story was, there's a little David in all of us, and you can go and kill your giants in Jesus' name. And then he gave a bunch of superhero references that went way over my head because I wasn't about that life. I didn't live that life as a kid. I didn't do any of the superhero stuff. And that was the crux of the message. Let me share with you some important news today. We're not David. We're not David. You and I are not David. Do we have giants in our life? Absolutely. Do they seem like they're nine feet, nine inches tall? Absolutely. Do we at times cower down in fear? Absolutely. Do we at times think we're gonna pick up our sling and slay some giants? Absolutely. There are some micro parts of this story that we can relate with David on, but the macro part is certainly not that because when we pick up our stones and when we cast them at giants, we miss 100% of the time and we miss bad. Most of our greatest problems actually come from us assuming we're something greater than we are. Most of our greatest problems actually come from us inserting ourselves in the middle of our story. Most of our greatest problems often come from us elevating ourselves more highly than we ought to. Most of our greatest problems come from us putting ourselves on a throne that was never meant for us. And most of our greatest problems come from us throwing stones oftentimes at the wrong giants in our lives. Can I tell you what I wanted to do when I received that text message that I shared with you some five years ago from my biological father that at first caused me to leap with joy, but only to read it and find out that I was let down tremendously? I wanted to let loose with these texting thumbs and this rhetoric that the Lord has blessed your boy with. And I wanted to just let him have it. And I wanted to just keep going and going and going because I wanted to throw stones in the form of hurtful words to a man that in all reality, I just wanted to love me and I just wanted him to care about me. To a man who I really just wanted to know and I want to know. To a man who I wish could have been in my life. 
to a man who I wish could have been at my ball games as a kid watching me go one for five with a single. To a man who I wish could have been at my graduation and at my wedding and in the waiting room of my daughter's birth. My natural instinct was to wanna to pick up stones and be David and cast them as hard as I could at the one who was causing me pain in the moment. But I'm not David in this story. And he's not my giant. And that's great news. Because Christ is a much greater David. He is a much greater David. And those giants that are very real in our life that we talked about earlier, the same giants that cause us to either become so white hot angry that we can feel it or become so cowardly that we just run away. Those same giants are the same giants that are meant to cause us to take refuge in the one who created us as the author of Colossians says, who we were created for and through and by, Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, the greater David, the one who is known as the son of David, the greater king, the Messiah, the chosen one, the only true champion, Jesus the Christ. I've been finding refuge in this last week in the book of Colossians, in the last couple of days in particular, and I feel that these words speak so poignantly to this point, so... We're just getting a whole lot of text this morning and we're gonna get out of here because I really only had one main point and I just wanted to read a bunch of scripture today because it's Father's Day and I need a day off too. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Colossians chapter three, verses one through 17. Just listen to this. I, 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 when I was reading it, I knew I was preaching on David and Goliath. I was like, oh, this is such a great parallel. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And then Paul goes on to name some huge giants. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. How do we put them to death? We go to Christ. We hide in Christ. Our lives are hidden in Christ with God, Paul says. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves, more giants here, of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Do you see the difference as the people of God here? Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's the word I needed to hold on to five years ago. And that's the word I still need to hold on to today, and so do you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body, you were called 
to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do you see that we're not David here? Do you see that we're really not that impressive? And we're really not that heroic? And we shoot and miss, and this is why the gospel should be so sweet to our ears, because in our weaknesses, Christ chose to die for us, despite of us because he loves us and cares for us and knows that we cannot knows that we cannot measure up this is the beauty of the gospel and when we insert ourselves as the hero in this by in this story and in all over the bible we miss the gospel we miss the point the sooner we come to the place of hiding ourselves in Christ with God confessing that as we read scriptures and we examine our lives, we're more like the Israelites in this story. We cowered away, we fear. We're weak, we're desperate, we're outmatched, and it's okay, and it's okay because as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, we are called to find ourselves hidden in Christ, and we are called to take refuge in this strong tower. Because the truth is, our Goliaths are greater than what I just named and what Paul just named here in Colossians chapter three. That those are serious Goliaths, those are serious battles, those are serious sin struggles that you certainly may be dealing with today. But the reality is we have greater Goliaths that Christ has already conquered. Sin, death, and Satan. And he has conquered them. He has trampled over them and defeated them by his death on the cross and affirmed that through his resurrection. And we can take refuge in that. And he didn't need us to help him. But he invites us to live within him and to hail him king and victor. For our victory is in him and it is in him alone. So take heart, my friends. Take refuge, King Jesus is our victory, oh hail King Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm grateful as someone who has sought to take stones and to cast them at giants in my own strength and in my own flesh, I have only realized that that has only in my life gotten me in trouble and caused me to have to come to you in repentance. Father, for you are a greater giant. You are a greater David. You are a greater king. And you are our Messiah. And we can run to you and our life is meant to be found in you, in Christ, in God. And may we take refuge in that. May we take joy in that. As we live in a culture that has a manhood problem, I'm humbled to see men here today, and I know many men who are gone spending time with their families, who, who are finding their lives hidden in Christ and God. I'm humbled to be among them. I'm humbled to join them. I'm humbled to accept our weaknesses together as men and to just take comfort in Christ the King. And so Father, as we sing this last song this morning, may our hearts rejoice and may our hearts find peace 
in the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May we celebrate you today, God. We thank you for our strength is in you and the battle is yours, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.